Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to our live broadcast. Broadcasting live in Second Life, live on our website via audio, and recording for upload to YouTube. And of course live here in Hamilton to a live studio audience. We're over full. We now have seven people staying in this house. No, do we? We have six people right now, and tonight we'll have a seventh supposed to be coming. We're over full. Just can't turn people away. Just can't keep people. They're breaking down the doors to get in. That's how passionate people become. Religion, religion is such a powerful thing. You know, the word religion has such a bad reputation or such a specific reputation that makes a lot of people uneasy when they hear the word. So I think it's important to reform the word. Religion means taking things seriously. So tonight's talk is about someone who, well, not actually so much about him, hopefully, but it uh, involves a discussion with someone who took Buddhism quite seriously, took the Buddhist teachings quite seriously. And he stands out as someone who is remarkable in terms of taking the Buddhist teachings seriously. He was um, designated by the Buddha as foremost of the Buddha's disciples who went forth, who left the home life out of faith, out of confidence. So who had a religious, a sense of religiosity. His name was Ratapala. You know the story of Ratapala. It comes in the Jimanikaya uh, Sutta 82. It's called the Ratapala Sutta. So the story goes, Ratapala heard the Buddha's teaching and realized that it was quite difficult for him to practice it while living at home. He thought to himself, wow, this sort of teaching isn't the kind of thing you can do while surrounded by sensuality and caught up by daily affairs of the quote-unquote real world. It's not the real world, but what people would call the real world. The ordinary mundane contrived artificial world of society that we've put together to help us achieve our sensual, our goals of sensual pleasure. Mm, not so useful for becoming enlightened, too busy, too caught up in defilement. So he decided he wanted to go forth, uh, he wanted to become a monk, but um, He asked the Buddha to ordain him, and the Buddha asked, you know, do you have your parents' permission? And he said, no, I don't have my parents' permission. And the Buddha said, well, I don't ordain people who don't have their parents' permission. And so he had to go back to get his parents' permission. And to make a long story short, his parents uh, didn't give permission, and he, he, uh, he lay down on the floor. He did... He pleaded and begged with them, but eventually he lay down on the floor and said, I'm not going to eat or drink or do anything. I'm not going to get up off this floor until you allow me to ordain. And so they waited him out for a while, but then he, he, he made good on his threat, and he just lay there and started starving to death. And uh, they called his friends to try and convince him, and his friends came over, talked to him, and then went and talked to his parents and said, Look, he's pretty serious about this. How about this? You know, if you let him ordain, at least you'll get to see him alive. You can go and visit him, but uh, if if if, he, if you don't let him ordain, he's going to die. Then you won't see him. Then he'll be gone. So let him ordain. And the story goes on and on. But this uh, tonight, I didn't want to talk so much about his story, as interesting and as inspiring as it is. 
Later on in his life, he was living, I can't remember where he was living, but he went somewhere and met, a, met with a king. And uh, king asks him, let me see if I can find him, uh, Koravia, yeah, okay, I was going to say, Koravia uh, was the name of this king, or the name of the place where the king lived, I think it was actually the name of the place. And the king, the king came to see him, and he said to Ratapala, he said, you know, I know people who, who leave the home life and, and go to the forest to do their religious thing, and they do it for one of four reasons. They do it because they've, uh, they've gotten old. They do it because they've gotten sick. They do it because they've lost wealth, or they do it because they've lost their relatives. So someone who, who is old can no longer work and is feeble and, and uh, can't find any, any sort of solace or, or status or, or work or, or activity in the, in the world of young people, and so they go off into the forest. And, become a religious person. This actually happens even in Buddhism. Old people become monks and it's somewhat troublesome because well, they often get sick. And that's the second one is people get sick and then they want to go off and to the forest. Well, there's not much they could do in India at the time. Nowadays we just put them in old age homes and forget about them. But same sort of thing. <laughs> they didn't have old age homes. They just sent them off into the forest to live or to die. Or someone who loses wealth and become impoverished and have to become a beggar and have to live under a tree or on, in a ditch or something. Also common then, also happens now. Or, uh, or through re loss of relatives, relatives who maybe took care of the person or maybe just out of grief they would realize the um, suffering of life and, and leave the world. And he said, but you, you're young, you're healthy, you come from a good family, they're all still alive. What was it that caused you to, to leave home? Why did you leave behind the world? It's a good question. You know? With all the wonderful things that we have in the world, why do we leave it? Why do we come here? Why do you come here to torture yourself? You know? Even just to meditate, people will go to the monasteries, temples, churches, uh, when something bad happens. So it's remarkable to see someone who is, has their whole life ahead of them, could be, uh, could be capable of so much in the world. And This is why Ratapala's parents wouldn't allow him. They were quite upset that he wanted to throw away his wonderful future, all the wonderful and good things he could do, right? He wanted to do this useless thing of becoming a a recluse, becoming a Buddhist monk. How useless they thought. And Ratapala, so Ratapala's answer is, is well known in, in the Buddha's uh, dispensation. He, he claims that it comes from the Buddha. Now I'm, I'm not sure if we actually have somewhere where the Buddha said this. We very well may have, but Ratapala is the one who's known for, for giving it. He says it comes from the Buddha. He said there are these four Dhammudesa, and Udesa comes from Disa. Disa means to, to indicate, Dika, Disa, it's the same. So the things the Buddha pointed out, four Dhammudesa, four indicators, Dhamma indicators. And when these were pointed out to me, I, I realized that I had to leave. I had to do something. And I think these are quite useful, not just for encouraging people to take up meditation or take up Buddhism, but also to encourage us in our practice and to remind us why we're here when we get discouraged. And to sort of focus our attention on what's really important, clarify and, and keep us on track. 
So the first is um, Upaniyati Loko Aduvo. The world is uncertain, the world is unstable. Hmm. So all these good things, I mean just the fact that those losses exist, you don't need to experience the loss to know that that's a part of life, to know that it's a danger, and to start to question, what am I doing here, wasting my time when I certainly won't be prepared for for old age, for sickness, for loss, for death, and the uncertainty of life, all the things that we hold dear, even our own selves, even our own families, our own situation, everything about us is unpredictable, chaotic. That's the first reason why one would go would go off and become a monk or become or go off and practice meditation. The second one is atano loko anabisaro. This world has no refuge, no master or, or guardian, protector. And the king questions him on all these. He says, well, what do you mean? It seems very constant. Here I'm the king, and uh, I, life is very constant for me. They said, well, you know, do you remember when you were young and you could shoot an arrow or ride a horse? Can you do that now? Oh, impermanence, you see. Old age comes to us all, seeing this and knowing that this is the case. Yeah. Go forth. And then he says, well, what about this? No protector. What do you mean? I've got elephants, I've got warriors, I've got lots and lots of refuge and protectors. He said, well, what if you get sick? Suppose you get really sick. Are your elephants going to protect you from the sickness? Is your family, are your, your warriors, are they going to stand around you and keep the sickness away? No, no, there's nobody who can protect you. Right? And our, when we're young, we're, this is one of the big shatterings of youth, the realization that our parents can't protect us from suffering, this shock of growing up, realization that suffering is, is um, that we are vulnerable to suffering, we're not protected from it, we're not sheltered from it, there's nothing that can shelter us from it. Uh, number three, uh, asako loko sabang bahaya gamaniyanti. This world is not an owner, it has no ownership, it's nothing of its own. It goes having abandoned everything. King said, well, what do you mean? I, I go with everything, full jewels, and we have so much that is ours, right? We've got our cars and our houses and our families and our friends and our iPhones and our computers and our everything. We've got so much, it's all ours. We go with it. Mm -hmm, no. No, you don't go with any of it. He says, do you know whether you're going to be king in the next life? You know, whether you're going to be human in the next life, to be, even enjoy the riches, maybe you'll be born a, a hungry ghost guarding your own treasure, or maybe you'll be born an, uh, an ant or a termite living in the wood wall of the palace. But not just in the next life. All of our possessions, right? We can't hold on to them. We can't say, let this be mine forever. Let this car or this house or this iPhone, let it be mine. Even our friends and family and, and even our own bodies don't really belong to us. We're borrowing them and, 
not even borrowing them because we don't know when it, when they're going to be taken back. We're borrowing. We're, we're, it's like we've stolen them, and we're just waiting for the police to come and arrest us. Wait until we get caught. It's like we've stolen. We're living on stolen time. So we got to get as much pleasure and use out of it, joy ride in this body that we have, and then death comes and catches us and wham, takes it away. And we don't know when that's going to be. We're just trying to run away. We're on the, we're on the lamb. We're on the run. Uh, death is on our heels. It's a good analogy. And number four, uno loco atito tanha daso. Una. Una mean, una is the same, it's where the word want, want and un. It's from the same place. Una means wanting. This world is wanting, is lacking. Atita, unsatisfied. Tanha, tanha daso, the slave dasa, slave of tanha, of craving. And he says, what do you mean? I can satisfy myself any time. I get whatever I want. I'm always satisfied. I eat and then I'm satisfied. And the Buddha says, well, what if you heard about another kingdom that was weak but had lots of resources and they told you that it was ready, for, right for the taking? What would you do? Oh, I'd conquer it. And what about uh, another one and another one? You never have enough. The Buddha said, it could rain gold. It could rain gold or precious jewels. And the shower of them would never be enough for a human, for, for, for one being. It's the nature of craving. The very nature of craving is that it's habitual. It's um, ever-increasing. It, it's self-perpetuating or self-enforcing. or It feeds itself. It becomes stronger the more you engage in it. It's a very scary thing. We're always unsatisfied. We can never be satisfied. Seeing this, many people leave home when they realize how, how unsatisfied they are, how they can eat and eat, and all they're gaining is more and more craving. It's one of the big things you realize here is how attached we are to diversion. How unable we are just to be with ourselves, just to have the patience to be, you know. Such a simple thing, you think, well, that's easy. Um, but isn't it ridiculous how we can't just be? We, we, we can't be ourselves, right? We have to do, make, create, get. Quite, quite surprising because we, 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 I think we generally have this idea that we can just be, that we always are, right? But we're, we aren't. We're not good at aring. We're not good at being. We have to do, we have to get so much craving and aversion. We have so many inbuilt reactions to everything. So realizing this, realizing all four of these things, this is what leads one to go forth, to become a monk, to practice meditation. This is the encouragement, the reminder to all of us that we're here for a reason. We're here to find, figure this out. We're here to solve this problem, the problem of impermanence, and that the world, any any goal we might attain, any object we might acquire, anything we might become will always be unstable, uncertain, impermanent. 
that there's nothing that can keep us from the vicissitudes of life, there's no protection, there's no refuge, there's nowhere we can go, nothing we can do to avoid the vicissitudes of life. There's uh, that all of our possessions can't protect us, all of our friends and family, we leave them all behind. That all the things we hold dear and all the things we crave and love and cling to, they're not ours. They'll be gone, we'll be gone from them soon enough. And finally that craving, we are, we are slaves of craving, slaves of desire. We are not masters of our desire. Our desires are not our possession that we can control. They are the master, we are the slave. Very scary reality. And the scary, these scary realities encourage us because some, there is something that can protect us. There is a refuge, and that's the Dhamma, that's the, the truth, reality, seeing things as they are. Once we learn how to just be, and we become content, we become stable, we, we become invincible. We know that there's no coming or going, and we free ourselves from suffering. So there you go. There's the Dhamma for tonight. Fine teaching handed on by Ratapala, the Buddhist monk with the greatest faith and the greatest confidence in going forth. No doubt in his mind. He would have done anything. He would have died just to do what we're doing. And it's a good example of, of religiosity and how wonderful and powerful it can be. So there you go. Thank you for tuning in. Have a good night.